Well, good morning, good morning. Well, I've been chastised several times for coming off without your name tags. So uh, I also came out without my sweater, which I wish I had. So it's that kind of day for me, apparently. And I hope the James that we met have a better day than I have so far. Because they're our speakers. James and Ann are retired public school educators who have made their home in Vermont since the late 70s. He James started high school social studies in Enosburg and history and geography at CCV. Anne taught first grade at Montgomery Center. Apparently had enough of that, huh? Because she went to work. 31 she, years, I think I, I think Oh, <laughs> it doesn't say 31 years here, man. I started when I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she started when she was 10. And then she worked as an immigration officer for Homeland Security. Um, they both enjoy gardening and travel, as you will find out, and made a similar trip to Ireland about five, some five years ago. Well, they're back to Ireland, uh, Iceland, Iceland, Ireland, 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 Ireland and Iceland are different places, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Would you please welcome our own James and Anne Wheelett. Thank you, John, and thank you all for coming here today. Uh, I just want you to know that this trip to Iceland that we did this spring, I actually had wanted to do that trip five or six years ago, and I was talking to myself and said, oh, Anne will never go for Iceland. She won't get past the name. So, so I said, but she will go to Ireland because we got, we've got, she's got relatives there. So we did Ireland first, and then in, in, in the interim, I had a, a colleague of mine who went with his, his girlfriend, and Anne had a former colleague that went with her husband, and everybody raved about Iceland, so that got her at least interested in exploring it. So, and I have to give her credit for, for setting up the trip. She did all of the arrangements. Um, we worked with a tour company, and they were wonderful uh, to work with. So, um, before I, I begin the presentation, I want you to draw your attention to this table over here, and then we have a map that's on the, uh, on the uh, wall. So those are two uh, sweaters that we purchased in Iceland. There's a little bowl there with what looks like some, some black jelly beans. They are not jelly beans, they're stones, <laughs> they're rocks. <laughs> uh, and then we have a, a book that Anne uh, uh, put together, and uh, uh, she's now a published author. To a shutterfly, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And then, of course, we got some. We've got some money, which is which is not common. Now. Iceland is cl close to being a cashless society, as anyone on the planet. Very close. Uh, it's, so it's electronic. I mean, you you can use a car to go pee. You know, you go to, yeah. So it's it's. Say again. Yeah, I think it's a European thing. I think most of the other world, you know, the rest of the world does this. Uh, and so we worked through a tour company. Uh, they were absolutely incredible. They set up the stops along the place because we didn't know what was worth seeing. So anyways, with that, uh, <clears throat> so Iceland, land of fire and ice. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, so you see over here uh, the map of Iceland and you see the various uh, glaciers that are in there. So there are 269 glaciers in, in Iceland, summer big and some are very, very small. Uh, and we did see the ones that you could, as you drove along the coast, because Iceland basically, uh, for all of its area, only about 20% of that is habitable. The rest of it, the central part, is just basically uh, barren uh, lava fields. Uh, so, up next. So it's the land of fire. There are roughly 130 volcanoes in Iceland. I don't think they're, all of them are active. I think there's a few that are active. I mean, we, we've had some of the news in the past few years that have uh, disrupted uh, traffic. <coughs> Go ahead. So Iceland is in Europe. It's a European country. It is the westernmost part of, of Europe. Okay. And uh, one of the characteristics about Iceland is that it, they have tons and tons of geothermal energy. In fact, their heat, they heat many of their towns and villages, and even the city of Reykjavik um, 
has a lot of its, its heating uh, done through geothermals. They have these huge, huge pipelines. You can see them in the western part of the, of the country where they're moving hot water and steam through the landscape to be used to heat homes and buildings. Uh, I, I heard a rumor one time that they even heated their sidewalks, and, but I don't know if that's true or not, so I'm gonna say, I don't know. I'm gonna hold that, okay? So uh, it's certainly one of, the, one of the most impressive things. There's a whole industry behind geothermal. They're working with other countries in the world to do uh, carbon sequestr sequestration. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's a pretty advanced country, and a lot of this happened, has happened since World War II, or even actually maybe even later, uh, where they've really moved into the technology for energy efficiency, they have a vibrant tech center. Um, it's a pretty cool place to, to see. Okay, so how big is Iceland? Well, it's 103 square kilometers, and that compares to 102. Uh, in Kentucky, Virginia, 110, and look at Vermont, 24,000 square kilometers, right? And so I, I uh, brought it, you know, bring Vermont into this because if you look at the area of Iceland, you say, wow, well, you know, it's quite a bit larger than Vermont, and yet when you look at the populations of the two places, we got twice the population on a quarter or a fifth of the land area, so it's quite a contrast. So what's it like to live in Iceland? Well, it's, it's cool and windy uh, and rainy. And it's, you know, I mean, they, they do have snow, snow also, but it's, um, it's kind of like here in April, except almost year round. Their summers are very cool, very mild, uh, and wet. But, um, <laughs> one of the really coolest things we experienced <clears throat> when we arrived there was that the first day of summer is celebrated in April and it is a national holiday. <laughs> Back to that. <laughs> and, <laughs> all right, I know, I know this type is, 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 is kind of small, so I'll just blast through it. So it's a, it has a unitary form of government. Now we have a federal system where we have, the federal government has certain powers and the states have certain powers and then they share with governments or sub-government units like counties and towns and cities, right? In Iceland, you have national government, and then you have local government. Okay. Now, they have a president, which deals with other countries, and they have a prime minister. Now, we had one of our, our um, tour guides one time that told us, says, you know, if you meet the prime minister or the president on the street, you can call him by his first name. They're, they don't sit on titles. And I think that that's a heritage out of sort of the Viking heritage where they were very informal about leadership. It's kind of a fluid thing. Um, but one of the really interesting things about Iceland is that it has the oldest legislative assembly in the world. And it's been active since the 900s. So that's pretty interesting. Now its economy, as you would expect, since the uh, 80s or so, tourism has become very, very important. So that tourism used to be the number two global income generator. Uh, and it's certainly true for Iceland. So fish processing, as you would imagine, is, is one of the things that they do. Uh, and then they have aluminum smelting. Now, it's aluminum smelting, that's pretty interesting because Iceland has no bauxite to make aluminum. But what they do have that you need to make aluminum is electricity. So they have hydropower, they have lots and lots of rivers, so they can generate the electricity that they need be able to process the bauxite into aluminum, which is, is an export product. And of course, uh, geothermal power, they're not exporting it, but they are using it uh, to give them energy self-sufficiency. They got tons of big rivers, they got tons of geothermal energy. So they don't have to buy much by way of energy, if any, uh, except for hydrocarbons for their automobiles and maybe their boats for fishing. Um, and they have a, a vibrant medical and pharmaceutical uh, products industry. <clears throat> so this is the, this is the ring road that we took. We started here in Reykjavik and we moved along the southern coast, up east coast, north, and then west. Okay. Oh, by, by the way, it's April 18th to May 2nd. Now, I say that because you're going to see us dressed as we go around and sometimes we're looking like we're dressed for the polar north. <laughs> <laughs> 
time. <laughs> All right, and Anne is up. So I took over 900 pictures on this trip. It was just incredible. After two or three days, I said, if I see nothing more, this, this is the trip of a lifetime. But every day was something new. Um, so this company, um, they arranged all of our lodging. We did a 14-day driving tour. Some places we stayed two nights, some days, some places we only stayed one night, depending on what there was to see in the area. Um, they were wonderful to deal with. Uh, they picked us up at the airport. We flew out of Burlington in the afternoon and flew to Newark, and we left Newark at 8.30 in the evening and arrived at 6.15 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they met us at the airport, just like the movies, holding up the sign, you know, <laughs> Anne Willette. And um, they drove us to our, to our hotel, which was the, our, where we stayed the first night in Reykjavik. And we basically just stowed our luggage. They, they always say, don't, don't go to bed, even though you've been up for 24 hours. Just stay up and go as long as you can. So we did. Um, we stowed our luggage at the hotel. Right. Yep. And we, this is a, a huge Lutheran church that it's um, right in the city and very visible. It was a, a great landmark um, as we were walking around. Um, and then we noticed as we walked around, um, a lot of the buildings had beautiful murals painted on the sides of them. So just. It was, a, it was a really a nice walking city. Um, we walked down to the harbor. They had a beautiful um, performing arts center. And, and there was this lovely rainbow walkway that led right up to the church. Uh, what's not really apparent in, in these photos so far is that most of the buildings, including houses, the walls and the floors, because they just don't have the lumber and they just don't have the money to import that much lumber to build. Now, they do have some wood frame buildings, but uh, those are old. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, the next morning, I mean, we, we didn't do a whole lot that day, wandered around, um, grabbed something to eat, and crashed probably early late afternoon, early evening. But the next morning they came, um, picked James up at the hotel and took him to get the rental car. I thought I wasn't gonna see him again because it took him a while to figure out he, that navigation system and it was a keyless car and a hybrid. And So when he got back to the hotel, he packed up and headed off and our first stop was the Thingveller National Park. And this national park was declared in 1930 and it's a huge, go ahead James, it's a huge fissured rift valley that's caused by the meeting of the North American and the Eurasian tectonic plates. And this is where the Vikings established that first democratic parliament in 930 that James mentioned. And these were the only standing structures. There was a church, and this was called a, a, a summer house and a cemetery. We were able to walk right down in that area. But there were a lot, a lot of rivers, <coughs> this is a video, that went underneath the walkway and um, incredible and, and waterfalls that fed one of Iceland's largest lakes. I think there's another one. Oh, that's no, okay. So, that, no, you're good. Okay. Here's this water going in. Go ahead. There we go. So not too far down the road were these uh, geysers, and it's pronounced geyser, and it literally means gusher. So the, it's a geothermal area. It, it contained um, what's called the Great Geyser, which has been active for about 800 years, but since 1916, it hasn't, its eruptions were very rare. But luckily, right near there, this is um, very reliable geyser, much more so than 
than Yellowstone when I remember holding my camera till I thought my arms were going to fall off. And, and you rarely have to wait more than five or ten minutes before you see this. Yeah, the kids <laughs> We got to, we got to, in a few minutes, you know, short time, we got to see it erupt several times. So, so from there, we headed to um, Gulf Foss. A lot of the Icelandic names are 16 or 20 characters long and no idea how to pronounce them, but we soon discovered that um, anything ending with Foss was a waterfall and things that ended in Vatten meant mountain, but no, no, that's the mountain. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, and by the way, um, I think it's on this map over here. There, the Iceland's the place names actually have meaning. So, I think on this map over here, they have a sort of if you see this ending on a word that means this, so you can actually make sense of, of what it is because the names are pretty daunting. <laughs> I was given a, a history of Iceland by a neighbor of mine because she knew we were doing this trip, so it took me forever to read it. And then uh, one day I remember I was reading and they had, a, they had a, a name in Icelandic at the bottom of the page and it just, it did half of, the, half of that last line and then I flipped the page and it was continuous. One more. <laughs> 20 some odd characters. <laughs> So th this is Iceland's most famous waterfall, and the day we arrived, go ahead, it, you couldn't have asked for a more picture-perfect day. Um, blue skies, um, beautiful rainbow, <laughs> it was not photoshopped. <laughs> and it's a spectacular two-tiered waterfall, and it drops 32 meters, and it's in a narrow canyon that's about 70 meters deep and two and a half kilometers long. And just to show a video to see the power of this waterfall. And then this is where it makes its drop. So this is a, we stayed at a lot of different places, some were hotels, a lot were just little B&B, Airbnbs, and this is what a typical room looked like. They were all very similar. Um, you, you, we each had our own little duvet or comforter, so we didn't have to fight over the covers. <laughs> but very, very um, minimalist, but quite comfortable. And, and the bathrooms also, small, but very functional. You can see that the, the doors to the shower fold in against the wall when you're not using it, and then you just pull them out so they didn't take up much room. And almost every room had a, a heated uh, towel rack, which was really nice. Sometimes I'd wash out some socks and hang them over that, and they'd be dry <laughs> the next morning. So, our next stop was the um, Carid Crater. And uh, if you can go ahead and hit the next one. So this is a beautiful oval crater. It's about 270 meters long, 170 meters wide, and 55 meters deep. And it was in a row of craters. This was at the northern end. So this one wasn't really formed by an eruption. And it had this gorgeous lake. You can see how clear because you can see the clouds reflecting and the water at the bottom varies between 7 to 14 meters deep. So we walked around the rim of the crater and then there were stairs and we walked down and I stuck my hand in the water and it was pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> So this next waterfall is called the Ira Foss Waterfall. It was a, a small one. Um, it was one of the few excursions that we booked ahead of time. So we got to ride these little Icelandic horses um, with, a, with a tour group to the waterfall. And the Icelandic horses are um, 
they're well protected and they, they take good care of them. For, of they're co very concerned about the health of the herd. So they said if we had horses at home, we weren't allowed to wear anything that we might wear around our horses at home so we don't bring any diseases. And if any Icelandic horse leaves Iceland, they are not allowed to come back. And the unusual thing about them is they have a fifth gate and it's supposed to be a very smooth gate. James, <laughs> James didn't find it that much smooth. No, I had, I he had, had some I issues. Had <laughs> <laughs> and you, you signal the horses to do this fifth gate. You pull up on the reins because they 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 step so high that if their head is not lifted, they would knock themselves in the in the chin. But it, it was fun. And, they're, they're a little smaller than uh, horses they have here, sort of just a step up from a pony. So this was a, um, another waterfall, Seljansfoss, and this is um, after Gullfoss, it's one of the, probably the most visited um, waterfalls. And the, if you drive, when you drive along Iceland's southern coast, you just see one waterfall, oh. and then another waterfall, and another waterfall. Some just, big, some just, big. They just keep coming down. They just keep coming right <laughs> off the escarpment, so it's pretty cool. So this one, this is a good one. So this, um, the water plummets 40 meters over this cliff, and it was wet and <laughs> cold, but we were ready. We had our water gear. Um, and what's unusual is you can actually go behind the shoot of this waterfall. Yeah. You can see these people jumping and it was pretty impressive. So as we traveled along, we, we were going for miles and miles and seeing this carpet. Um, we were trying to decide what it reminded us of and I thought it we, we are big fans of Game of Thrones and the dragons. I thought it looked like dragon snot. <laughs> but it's actually called Moss Heath. And um, this family, uh, Moss family, can be traced back over 400 million years. And it absorbs the nutrients um, and water through its leaves. So if it's wet and rainy, it will be green. And then when it's you know, drier weather, it looks gray, but the carpet itself can actually be between 40 and 60 centimeters deep, thick. So it was pretty, uh, it just went on and on and on. Depended where we were traveling. Some days we were looking at glaciers, some days we were looking at moss. And this was one of our favorite um, places that we stayed. This was called the Magma Hotel. And that building was where we checked in and had, had our meals. But what was unusual is each room was, each of these little cabins was a room and the roofs were live. So, and the back of, you can't see it in the back, but um, it, they backed onto a little lake. And so they had a big sliding glass door, and it, it was just really a nice little place to stay. So you had your own bathroom, bedroom. And and sometimes a little sitting room too, I think, yeah. in a couple of places, yeah. And as we were leaving that hotel to travel to our next spot, this was the view. It was just incredible. We're starting to get more in the mountains and see more snow. And this is a rest area, just like you'd stop on 89, <laughs> only, one, only have to pay. <laughs> yeah, one thing to note is that, is that lots of these areas right here, these little rest areas, are on private land. So this is a, somebody's little business. And there was a set of stairs, so you could go up and, and have sort of a viewing area because, I mean, the mountains were incredible. So this is the, um, the rain is Fiara, which is the black beach, and the sand is all black, volcanic, volcanic sand, and the pebbles, you'll see a picture, and I have some over there in a jar that look like black jelly beans. 
it just as smooth as can be. And the, the sneaker waves, that's, those are waves, they're monster rogue waves, so they warn you not to get too close <laughs> to, the, to the edge of the, the beach because they, they just come up and they have really strong current and the water is very cold, so if you got sucked out, you probably wouldn't last long. As you're, you know, if, you're, if you're standing a little too close to the water as the waves come in, they undermine, and sort of the sand begins to sink down and you begin to sink down. So uh, I actually had to scramble. Uh, yeah, get, another get couple there. and James were like, I said, didn't you read the sign? <laughs> and these are um, basalt columns, and according to, to, to legend, these are the masts of the ships that the trolls were trying to steal, and then they got caught in the sun. But this is what the beach looked like. And there were these crazy formations with openings. It's really beautiful. This was a, a hike that we took. It was called the Lost Canyon Walk. And um, this canyon was hollowed out probably millions of years ago by this Fiora River. And the trail just sort of followed the river up on top. And, and um, it was really, really pretty spectacular. So now we're heading into glacier country. <laughs> And um, it was just, just truly magnificent. You just mm -hmm. can't imagine. If this picture does not really show this, but if you can, you can see this little hint of blue over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's much more vibrant when you're there in person. <clears throat> so here's an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Someone like to say. <laughs> So this is the Vatna Yokel um, National Park, and this is where we actually walked, took a walk to, to the glacier. So you can see where. And we, this was a ways away. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, maybe what, a quarter, half mile? Mm -hmm. so, and this right here that you see, you know, here an angle, like you said. <laughs> so, so this right over here, uh, coming down toward the coast, and this is what's called the tongue of the glacier. And so as we get closer, you can see the thickness of the ice. And this is a, um, a glacier lake, so as some of the pieces of the glacier break or calve, um, they fall into this lake. You could, uh, some people, you could pay and take a boat ride out. They suited you all up with gear and flotation devices, but we, we opted to just walk around. You notice I look like I'm pregnant and about to give birth. <laughs> That's because I was, I was trying to anticipate any contingency in terms of, of weather, so I, I had some stuff packed in my, my pockets. <laughs> I mean, we basically dressed in layers like we were going cross-country skiing. We had, you know, depending if, if we were hiking and it was going to be wet, we might have these light ski pants over long underwear. We'd have a fleece, and then just an, an anorak, a windbreaker. But in my pocket, I had um, earmuffs. I had a, a woolen hat, which I think I only wore one day, um, and a neck warmer. So, you know, if we were doing a hike, like the canyon walk, we would get really warm, and then you get up at the top, and then you just peel off and stuff it in your pocket. <laughs> And this is an Aurora hut, which is basically a little um, hotel room on wheels. If you wanted to see the Aurora Borealis, if it was good viewing, you could rent this. It said it had a TV and a shower, and, and they would wheel it out onto the ice and secure you out there. <laughs> and you'd spend the night. And then they'd come and pick you up in the morning. We, it wasn't the best time of year for the Northern Lights. We were originally scheduled to go in September and had to cancel because James had an injury. Um, there was a couple of nights, there was a slight chance and um, the hotels would have a list and you could sign up to get a wake up call. So save you from 
jumping and looking out the window every <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, so this is another, um, this is a glacier lagoon. And it was beautiful. And it was right along this river. And you could see these just beautiful blue hunks of ice. Some would float by, and there were a lot on the shore. And you can see how big they are. That was a warm day. I, I see yeah. I'm even unzipped. Yeah. <laughs> and you can tell I'm getting birth on this. <laughs> this is video. So now we're, we, we've traveled along the, the southern part of the island and we're starting to head up to the east coast. And I, I, we were driving along and I said, James, stop, stop. And he said, they're just horses. And I said, no, they're not. Those are reindeer. <laughs> and, and they were just moseying along and they, I got out of the car and went right up and they just sort of walked a little bit further away. But I got a picture. And uh, they are the largest land mammal, but they're not native to Iceland. They were imported in the 18th century from Norway. And for a while, they, they thought they had all died because they didn't see any. And then gradually, the small herd started to appear in the eastern part of Iceland, which seems to be the only place that they are able to survive. And they come down in the lowlands in the winter to find food, and, and in the summer months, they're up in the highlands. So, so the, uh, the largest land mammal in Iceland is the Arctic fox. The one that's Anything that's digits. bigger than the Arctic fox has been imported. So the horses, the cows, the sheep, the reindeer, you know, the big dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, too, and we, we, we saw this in, in Reykjavik, Iceland, is a land or a country that loves its cats. You look in the, you look in store windows, and there's the cat all curled up. You know, like you'd go buy you'd land. go buy apartments that were on the street, and they would have um, there'd be two cats, one in a each in the window seat, and they would even have a little sign that would tell you their name. <laughs> 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 So they're definitely a cat society. <laughs> so what do the reindeer actually feed on? Lot lichen. That's Lots what I was thinking. Yes. Yeah. Lichen is what they usually. So as we're traveling, um, we're, East Coast, yeah. we're, we're in the area where there are more fjords. And we saw these funny little rings. And we weren't sure what they were. And we found out afterwards that they're, it's like a salmon hatchery. And there are quite a few of them you know, in different areas. So there are a lot of tunnels in Iceland. Um, they allow you shortcuts through the mountains, and some of them even travel, you're traveling underwater through the fjords. And there are 14 open tunnels right now. They range from 30 meters long to over 13,000 meters long. And, uh, one of them you had to pay a toll and you had to go online at least 24 hours before you were going through the tunnel and, and you paid the toll. Apparently it was such a feat of engineering to build this tunnel that they had hot water coming in one end and cold water. Anyway, they, 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 <laughs> they managed to overcome everything but it was very expensive so they have to charge a toll. So this, this um, uh, booking online 24 hours at a time just really illustrates how much Iceland is a cashless society. So if you're going to go to Iceland, make sure that one of your buddies is really good with technology. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so I saw this, um, the company gave us this nice little book um, that has each you know, each part of the, of the island, and they would have, open up so they can see the, so they'd have all the things you could see from point A to point B. So I saw this beautiful little blue church, and I said, I think we should take this little detour down to the, 
check out this church. It turned out to be the most scary ride of the trip. <laughs> it, it was snowing. You couldn't even see. We were going through a mountain pass. And, you know, we were in an all-wheel drive car, but not with snow tires. But still. And and first we were going up and then we were going down and all these hairpin turns and it's snowing like crazy and I'm praying and I kept saying, you know, if you're really not up to this, we can turn around. <laughs> but we got down to the bottom and it was not snowing at all. So this is a the closest port to the Faroe Islands in Europe. And it's known for a lot of um, beautifully preserved wooden buildings. And it's also an artistic hub of the country. So again, more murals, the, um, the rainbow walkway, it was really pretty. Yeah, it just really, really um, puts a spin on um, being a house painter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to do that one. Ever. So now we're heading to, to um, northern Iceland. And this is very much a geothermal area. And, and we would be driving along and there'd be steam vents and it's just steam coming out of the ground. Um, we booked our second excursion. These are the, um, the Mivatan hot baths. And this is at eight o'clock at night. We, we, we could stay there for two hours and it probably that's how it looked at 10 o'clock too because it just, at 10 o'clock it was still light. And the, they had two big pools. They had a swim up bar. They had hot tubs, a steam bath. Um, the water temperature was about 100 degrees and the air temperature about 20. <laughs> but, you, but quite honestly, when you got out, it didn't feel cold. It just felt like, oh, comfort. So this next video is, this is a steam vent that's right, that's our car. We were heading to our car. And I thought it was an airplane flying over. So you just listen how loud it is. And that's from that distance. And that's just the steam coming out of the ground. So we spent, I think, two nights. You can see it's snowing a little bit there. Um, these are the Mivatan steam flats, and it was this whole geological area with um, steam vents and hot springs. It, it smelled rather sulfury, and there were walkways that you had to stay on. Um, and the different colors are from the minerals that were in the, in the water. But this is a, a boiling mud. You know, these are, uh, because this is a, a, a huge thermal basin, yes. it's so similar to what you, you see in Yellowstone. Yes, yeah. very much yeah. so. I mean, you can just see everywhere just coming up out of the ground and bubbling and churning. It was pretty neat. So, so this, this is Heverfjall, which is a huge, it's probably the largest volcanic crater in Europe. And it was formed 2,500 years ago with a very explosive eruption. It's almost symmetrical. Um, it's about 452 meters high and over 1,000 meters across. And we, we, it was quite a hike from the parking lot up. We were pulling the layers off <laughs> and, and stopping to see the view, letting our heart rate slow down. And then when we got up at the top, it was very windy, and we walked around the, the entire rim. It was probably about two miles around the rim. You can see I'm holding my, my earmuffs because my <laughs> I was getting heated up. <laughs> Okay, now we have a quick quiz. All right, so folks, <laughs> what do you do when you're lost in an Icelandic forest? Stand up. <laughs> there are so few trees, and the ones that are there are just these little scraggly things. That, so that's kind of the big joke. You will, you will find plenty of 
plantation, you know, tree plantations in different places, you know, like Tamarack or Hemlock or something, uh, but they're few and far between. So they're trying to, to develop a forest uh, uh, Just economy. so many were lost because of the volcanic eruptions. So is there any foliage Not at all? Well, whatever this is right here. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, of course, we weren't in there. We were there in yeah. April, so yeah. it wasn't. Uh... So no, not really. Okay. <laughs> so this is this area is known as Dimmerberger, which means dark castles, and it's a giant, jagged lava field, and these columns and arches and caves were formed when the, the lava flowed over a marshy area and when the water in the ground started to boil, the rising vapors just created all these pillars and it was really beautiful. And there are little caves and so, um, and, and this was just a, this is I think, I don't know if this is me botany. Um, the actual mountain. I'm not sure. But it was beautiful, so I had to take a picture. And this is a, called a pseudo crater. So it wasn't it wasn't formed by an eruption. Again, when the boiling lava went over the cool, wet ground around the lake, it, it formed this crater. So we hiked around to some of those as well. And this is Godafoss, which is the waterfall of the gods. And so back when the year 1000, when they were having their national assembly, the speaker had to make a decision on what religion Iceland was going to have. And according to the, to the history, after he meditated for 24 hours, he decided it was going to be a Christian nation. So on his way home, he dropped all his pagan carvings of the Norse gods over this waterfall. So it's, you know. This this is a pretty common in, in European history where you had uh, a lot of uh, Germanic tribes that came through Western Europe, in France, Spain, and whatnot. So when the king decided to become a Christian, then everybody in the tribe became a Christian. <laughs> so it wasn't like you had individual choices, and this is what happened over here. I mean, should note over here, there's something a little bit curious about this waterfall. It's the Sand River feeding them. As you can see how it's much lower here than. So the Iceland's second largest city is Akuri, and it's about the size of St. Albans. So, and the, we just thought this church was was pretty. We we. Uh, walked around. It was right at the top of this huge hill. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the places that we wanted to see in the, in the city were closed just because of the day and the time we arrived. So we, we, we wandered around a little bit, but we didn't stay long. But I thought you'd like to see what their traffic lights look like. <laughs> and one of the things about the traffic lights is you get a red light before it goes to yellow, and then it goes to green, and before it goes back to red, you get another, you get, you get, you get the warnings going both ways. Um, just some more of the mountains. And this picture, although I hate it. <laughs> it's not very flattering. I, I, you know, we were trying to do a selfie and the sun was shining. <laughs> And, but, but this is where we cross the Arctic Circle. This was the highlight of James's trip. For me, that was the best. So this, <laughs> this little island right, right through the middle is um, 66 and a third degrees north. So that's the Arctic Circle. So we had to get a picture. <laughs> and I thought this was the, the most beautiful little picnic area. Although, So this, this town that we visited is, um, was one of the world's leading herring ports at the turn of the century. And there was a museum, so everyone said, you need to check out this herring museum. And they had five different buildings. They had um, artifacts and machinery and 
going back, this is when they used to um, use those little boats. <laughs> and um, this is what it looked like back in the day, in, in its heyday. And they would, the women were called the herring girls, and they actually lived in dormitories. And they would work on the docks, often with their children, um, so cutting up and salting the, the herring and putting them in the barrels. And they weren't paid very well, so they decided to go on strike. And the men took over for, I think, two days they lasted. <laughs> <laughs> and then they brought two days. and then they brought the women back and paid them better. <laughs> and this was the, the original tank that they used to um, store the oil, the herring oil. And this is what the harbor looks like. I just love the, the bright colored buildings. This is down at the other end. Isn't that pretty? So now we're heading to West Iceland. And we stopped at this little fishing village that it was known for its historic houses. So we're, you're going to see some old wooden structures. And when you look at them, you might as well be a, in coastal Maine or on the Cape. It was just beautiful. And there was a huge ferry that the cars could drive on. And then we saw this church at the top of the hill. So we decided to take that little path. And it was a beautiful uh, Lutheran church. And that's what it looked like inside. A lot of very interesting churches. The churches in the countryside were all white, small white with red roofs. But then, then you'd find these really large ones. So this is the shark museum. And this family had been involved with sharks for over 100 years. They used to hunt them in small boats using seals as bait. Um, and now if a shark gets caught in the fisherman's net, net, they call this family and they come and they buy it. And they're Greenland sharks and they grow to be about 23 feet long and they can live over 400 years. And they were really valued for their um, the liver oil. But the meat is poisonous um, when it's fresh because it has a really high urea content. So it, it tastes like, it's like ammonia. And, um, but this urea helped to stabilize them because they were in really cold water and under a lot of water pressure, very deep. And so when they would catch the shark, they have to chop up the meat and put it in wooden crates for about six to 12 weeks, and that helps to reduce the toxins. And then they hang the meat in a drying shed for oh. another six months. <laughs> <laughs> so they had, they had all kinds of, go back just a second, I know you love that picture. But you know, they had all kinds of jaws, and you could see the rows of teeth, and they had okay, these jars of eggs, because the, the Greenland sharks, um, the, the eggs are retained inside the body, and then they are born. The, born the baby sharks are born live. Mm -hmm. They had all kinds of things that they'd found in the stomachs of the sharks, like parts of polar bears, and <laughs> it was it was quite the place. <laughs> and this is the drying shed where they would. And they reminded me of hams. You know, they kind of brown on the outside, and they would just cut a slit in the top and then that would form a handle and they would just hang it, hang it up to dry out in this drying shed. Now did you taste that? Yes, we well, did. Well, we did. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> the little, little white ball over here, that's, those are cues of shark meat. So if you, if you tasted it just by itself, you, you could still get a little hint of the ammonia taste. But if you ate it and then had a piece of the bread, it was palatable. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I would uh, want to snack on. But, um, so I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie or the series Game of Thrones, and this is one of the mountains that's featured, and we drank.
drove right by it, and luckily it was a gorgeous day. Here's another church um, that we just happened to pass by, and they have their, the bells are in a sort of lone standing bell tower in the parking lot. This is another um, black sand beach. And this, believe it or not, is a lighthouse. <laughs> but Iceland, it, Iceland has no space program, it's not a rock. <laughs> <laughs> but it's concrete, so it just was kind of unusual. So this was our last um, excursion. Um, this is the Vigilmere Lava Cave. So this is uh, the largest lava tube in Iceland. And it was formed by the lava flow. And, it, and it, as it flows out, it left the cave behind. And this cave is over 5,000 feet long. Um, in some places, the walls were over 50 feet apart. And at the highest point, the ceiling was over 50 feet tall. But it's real, it was really well preserved because nobody knew it was there for a long time until part of the roof collapsed. You can see, you know, looking, looking up. And apparently it was a very, very snowy winter. You can still see there's, there was a lot of snow down there. So we, we were outfitted with our helmets and our, our little light and headed into the cave. Um, some of the chambers were warmer than others. This is a, um, where it was a little warmer and the water was dripping and it was forming the stalactite. Stalag? Mites. Yes, I have to get that right. So this, yeah, these will <coughs> form in the colder months and then when the warmer months come along, they all melt to go away. So unlike the mineral stalactites uh, or mites, uh, then you know, these, this is recreated every, every year. And this, uh, you can see how large, this was called the red room. Some of the rooms just had beautiful colors depending on the rocks. And then this, this section, it, the whole wall looked like it was covered with chocolate frosting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is where the cave ends. They only have um, about 1,600 meters of the cave open to tourists. And they're constantly monitoring the conditions in the part of the cave where the tourists are and the other part, so they want to make sure that they're not doing anything that could harm it. So this was the end of, um, the, end of the line for us. And they asked us to shut off our, all of our lights. And the guide shut off whatever lights were in the cave. And we just stood there in silence. And you literally could not see your hand and it was pitch black and you could just hear the dripping and and she said that if you if people were to stay down in the cave for over 200 days you would go blind because your body would think you your were brain. blind and your yeah. eyes would just stop working the uh, the guy was uh, this this uh, little petite little irish girl and she uh, just as we were at the entrance Said, I said, we're going to go through this, this doorway over here. I want you to make sure that you bend your head to the side a little bit so you don't well, hit your head on, on, the, on the ceiling that's inclined like this. So you just have to watch out. Watch out for your head. And says, so, so we're going to go a little ways over here, and then we're going to go on our hands and knees. <laughs> yeah, and then we're going to swim across some water. <laughs> she was just yanking her chain. <laughs> but there, were, there was this Japanese family in the like a grandmother and a, and they were translating and, you, <laughs> and and for a minute I'm thinking okay my cell phone's in my pocket I want I want to make sure that I secure that before we start crawling but so th this was our, our last um, our last excursion and from there we drove back to Reykjavik turned in our um, rental car we spent the night at the the same hotel where we started. And celebrated with a meal of chicken wings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and uh, yeah, the next day they took us to the airport. And... So a couple of things about Iceland, well, one of the things about Iceland is that it's very expensive to be there. So gas is about 10 bucks a gallon. Uh, and uh, we, we paid, uh, 
about 70 bucks for two cheeseburgers, two fries, and two glasses of water, or a carafe of water. I mean, the water's free, but, uh, <laughs> but, but still, that's Bre a lot Breakfast, of we, we had a great, huge breakfast that came with the room every morning, and we took full advantage of that. Um, we packed um, two big bags of beef jerky and two big bags of trail mix, and for lunches, we'd buy some bread, some spread cheese, and some fruit. We'd fill our water bottles, and if it was warm enough, we'd have a picnic, and sometimes we'd stop and get a bowl of soup somewhere, but, but it was good. I, uh, I actually bought a bag of, of fish jerky, which Anne wouldn't let me eat in the room. Oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> that was really bad. Yeah. And uh, we'll leave you with this one thing. Uh, we see these, these little signs about Ye Big, the side of the road, it had this question on it, and it was, was James Bond Icelandic? <laughs> I'm not sure where that comes from, but you're welcome to research that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have questions or comments? Yes, sir. Was there a language barrier? No. Uh, well, here's an interesting thing. Because so many Americans visit there, so many people speak English, and that um, almost everyone who worked in the hospitality industry, whether it was a restaurant or a, a, a hotel or a motel, was from somewhere else. Um, from other parts Poland, of Europe. Poland. Yeah, there were lots of Poles and, and some Roma Romanians and Slovaks, Slovenians. Um, so they come there because they get free room and board and they get paid a pretty good wage. So, uh, and this, this one young woman from, I think Slovakia or Slovenia, came who says, so you like Iceland? She says, well, she said, I, I had a hard time breathing back in Europe because of my asthma. She says, I have no asthma here in Iceland. Yeah. So it's, the air is pure. If you want to, you're driving along your water bottle, you just stop your car, go down, and dip your water bottle into the river or the pond. It's safe. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, go. What part of the population, total population, Lives within about 20 miles of downtown Reykjavik. Oh gosh, it's, I think it's over 80%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the second largest city is the size of St. Albans. We would drive, <laughs> we, everything else has to be smaller. <laughs> Sometimes we would drive for hours and not need a car. Yeah, that's up, up in the north. Yeah. yeah. So. Now, what about, what about their schools? Oh, that's I, interesting. I wondered that too because I, I kept saying, where do these, how do these kids go to school? Because everything, I don't know if we really got an answer well, unless I, some of the. They, a lot of people, um, since the internet, of course, they can do a lot at home. Oh. Uh, otherwise, people have to be driven into the villages where the schools are. Oh. And another interesting, interesting thing is all these little towns and villages that you, that you drive through, if they have more than 1,000 or 2,000 people, they have this huge athletic facility that they can use because it's dark 24-7. With a big indoor uh, pool. Big indoor pools, all sorts of water slides, uh, courts for playing, you know, different sports, yeah. stuff and for fitness. Yeah. Uh, and people did look pretty yeah. fit, I gotta say. Was that seasonal? I'm sorry? Was it seasonal? The, the pools? Is yeah. Seasonal? They're open year-round. 24-7? 24-7. Wow. Yeah. I don't know about 24-7, but every... 365 days a year. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what were the roads like? Great. They were. They were yeah. great roads. There's only one section, I think, on the eastern side, we're going up that we hit a stretch of dirt, and I think it's because they were under reconstruction. Yeah. But the rest of the highways are good. And it's, interestingly enough, lots of the highways in Iceland were built by the U.S. Army during World War II and, and the Cold War. Not much truck traffic, probably. No. No, no. And you got to drive on the right hand side of the road, which was way better than Ireland. Oh, oh. <laughs> so there's some, um, excuse me, I'm in front of my head. So is there still an American military installation here? Uh, I think there might be a small military presence uh, because of uh, this is the lingering thing with Russia, with Russia, you know, and their subs. Because it, I think it's all part of a sort of a defensive ring. Well, I know that Rob and Vivian Warner would be Jimmy Warner's son. Uh -huh. They were there as a um, uh, civilian Navy contractor and uh, loved it so much they re-upped and both of their girls were born there. Uh -huh. 